Thank you, Marcello. So I would really like to thank Marcello and all the organizers for inviting me. It's great to, to get the opportunity to speak about my past life as an ion trapper. Um, so the, the official title on the web page is uh, Quantum Introduction to Quantum Simulators. Uh, I will try to stay true to the spirit, if not the, the letter of the title. Uh, but I will focus on trapped ions because of time and because of my own experience. Um, and I, but I hope that I, I can uh, show you some more general techniques and in general the flavor of what it means to, uh, to build a, a quantum simulator. So um, uh, let me then get started. Uh, the idea of uh, simulating uh, physics is pretty old. Uh, you, you see some uh, complicated physical system and, and then build a, a tabletop model that you can come and, and tune uh, some knobs at to try to understand uh, better uh, your object of study. Um, the Greek did this like 2,000 years ago and, um, and we keep doing this with uh, classical computers. Whenever uh, we find some phenomenon that we cannot in, uh, study analytically, then we can just build a numerical simulation. Uh, however, the problem when we get in, into trying to study uh, quantum phenomena that are quantum mechanical in nature is that um, you cannot, in most cases, efficiently simulate them with a classical computer. Uh, because, as you will know, every, um, any phenomenon that needs to be described quantum mechanically needs you to calculate usually over all possible trajectories and then the, um, the size of your, of your Hilbert space grows exponentially. And at some point, your classical simulation methods just blow up. Uh, so then uh, Richard Feynman had this very neat idea over four, almost 40 years ago and said, oh, well, if nature is quantum, then we need a quantum system to simulate it. And uh, that's what we're going to be discussing. How can we use a controllable quantum system to understand another quantum system that is not uh, directly experimentally accessible? Um, so for instance, uh, two things that we are going to be looking at are like magnetic um, uh, systems, or problems in particle physics. Uh, there are uh, problems where, uh, that are, in general, very complicated, where perhaps we know the, the basic equations that describe the physics, but uh, we cannot really solve the equations of motion. And then uh, we need to build um, some simulator to understand uh, either, for instance, how uh, the ground state of a magnetic system looks like, or the time evolution of, of some um, problem in particle physics. And in this talk, I will uh, restrict myself to seeing how we can implement uh, such problems on uh, trapped ions. And now I would like to branch a bit. And uh, just as in, in classical simulations, uh, like we can um, make simulations in two ways, either analog or digital. For instance, uh, we can uh, no, we no longer build orreries, so like, like mechanical models that, that describe the motion of the solar system. Now we use computers. Uh, but both approaches are equally valid. And in, in the exact the same way, in the quantum uh, world, we have um, these two complementary ways. So let's start with the analog quantum simulation, which is perhaps the, the conceptually most uh, simple one. The idea in analog quantum simulation is to design a system that mimics somehow the behavior of the other system that you want to study. Uh, and, and by mimic, I mean that has the same Hamiltonian or a similar enough Hamiltonian so that you can understand the physics that interest you. Um, for example, uh, you want to study um, the properties of uh, electrons in some um, potential created by some crystalline structure a basic problem in condensed matter physics. You cannot go and, and look at your material and, and, and see your electronic orbitals, but uh, you can, uh, in the lab, um, create an optical lattice, put atoms there, and it turns out that uh, these atoms behave um, very similarly to the way they would on, an, on this crystalline uh, potential. So then you have a system where you can actually tune interaction uh, ranges and, and uh, other physical properties, and then can study directly. Um, well, the very nice thing about such an approach is that you take a, a system that, that you build in the lab, and this system already has the interactions that you are looking for, uh, given by, it could be like dipole-dipole interactions with atoms, or uh, Coulomb interaction, 
or uh, whatever it might be, uh, they are already there. You don't have to, to go to great lengths to, to engineer them. However, this also means that you are less flexible because you, can, uh, you are restricted to using the interactions you already have present in your lab to simulate um, the, your, the, the, the physics that you want to. Okay, uh, so f now for generality, I would like to mention a couple of systems uh, that have been and are uh, used for analog quantum simulation. Um, I think in the past few days you have heard uh, much about uh, cold atoms. After Emmanuel Bloch and, and Jean Dalibard uh, spoke, I really cannot add anything else. Uh, but um, this is a, a classical of example of analog simulation, where you can, uh, in the lab, engineer uh, Hamiltonians that, that simulate um, uh, uh, interacting systems of bosons or fermions. Uh, other and you not only need to think about uh, atomic physics, uh, if you, for instance, um, you can engineer microwave resonators on a solid state uh, system and then couple them with superconducting qubits. And in this way, what you get is a system of interacting uh, bosons that you can arrange in a lattice. And then uh, by tuning the individual qubits that couple your resonators, you can tune the strength of the in interactions or couplings between uh, bosons. And so this uh, might give you also uh, much uh, flexibility. And um, even with, with less uh, si uh, usual systems like um, uh, photonic systems, um, there are experiments where you can um, uh, use networks of entangled photons that uh, mimic the correlations of um, chemical bonds in molecules or use interferometric setups uh, to um, simulate uh, quantum random walks. Uh, the, the idea that I'm trying to convey with these examples is that uh, there is a, a myriad of physical systems that, have, uh, that you have fine control on and the, that you can use for quantum simulation. Uh, but in this analog para paradigm, you see that each, each physical system has their own strengths. And, and you need to simulate something uh, where you already have these interactions. Now, what happens if the system that you want to study is not readily av available in the lab? Um, can you still do something? The answer is yes, although it might be a bit more tricky. And uh, the answer is digital quantum simulation. So the basic idea here is that we are trying to build uh, a more complicated Hamiltonian out of simpler building blocks that are available in the lab. Say, for instance, that uh, my system is described by, by this uh, Hamiltonian, this purple Hamiltonian here, which is the sum of two terms, might be two different interactions in the system, and they, in general, don't commute. And that's uh, the fun part about quantum mechanics. Uh, you have this, um, these two different physical effects, and if I know how these building blocks are available in the lab, like I can implement H1 or H2, but, they, but only one at a time, then how do I do to implement the full Hamiltonian? I cannot just do H1 and then H2 because they don't commute. It's not the same as doing H2 and then H1. What um, Lloyd realized, I mean, based on, on, on previous uh, work, was that if I break up um, these interactions in very short time steps and apply them stroboscopically one after the other, then in the limit where this time step becomes very small, I can actually uh, approach the, the, the exact evolution as close as I want. And then I can even uh, do higher order approximations to reduce the error. But the idea is this stroboscopic uh, exchanging of the terms uh, such that with only these very basic building blocks, you can apply them one after the other and build up a more complex uh, Hamiltonian. And uh, Lloyd showed that this ac is actually universal in the sense that you can simulate any um, physical Hamiltonian that has local interactions. That is, uh, interactions whose range doesn't grow with the size of the system. So this is an extremely powerful approach. It's extremely flexible because this means that uh, most physics you can go uh, to the lab and, and, and build once you have uh, a sufficiently powerful and, uh, quantum system. The downside is that as, um, to get a good enough approximation, you may need many steps. And also, it might not be extremely straightforward to generate these this single interactions in the lab. So um, implementing, actually, such a simulation might be more complicated than an analog simulation where all the physics is already there. Uh, pre-packed, so to say. 
Yes. Can you speak up a bit, please? If you have a need, yes. Yes. And you have a yes. Mm -hmm. um, we are gonna. Actually, I hope this gets answered later. Um, so, um, it's an excellent question. Like, how, how do I go from, from any arbitrary interaction that I have in the lab to, to a more general in, uh, interaction? The answer might not be straightforward, but it, so it can be done, and to make it more precisely, if the interactions that you, that you have in the lab can be used to build a, an, a, a complete set of quantum gates. So for instance, a, a two, like a nearest neighbor interaction uh, can usually, um, if you make it during a, a precise time, you can usually make a C naught gate out of it, right? So you have like, you can turn on your neural neural interaction and, and make it such that, that if this uh, atom is, is on, on state up, then the, the, atom, the, the following one will be, flipped to, to, will be flipped and so on. If you can um, uh, find in, uh, interactions in, in your lab that allow you to generate a, a universal set of gates, then in, in the quantum computing sense of the word, then, uh, then you can apply such techniques because you can always decompose your a more complicated interaction. Um, by the way, uh, please stop me at any time. The, I think the, we have more to gain here if, uh, by, by making sure that, that uh, we're on the same page that than just speeding along. Um, all right, so now the, the, the plan of the talk for, uh, for the rest of these uh, two hours will be first, I would like to introduce uh, quantum simulation with trapped ions. I will get a bit into the detail of, um, of, of the experimental implementation, not to overwhelm uh, anyone who is not actually interested in, in this, but rather to give a feeling of, of how this actually happens in the lab, and also uh, to show what are the building blocks, so these this gates that we can do in the lab and that uh, form this universal uh, set of gates. And then, um, I will show both the analog way by il and illustrate it with a uh, simulation of uh, easing models and the digital way and illustrate it with uh, an experiment uh, where we simulated uh, lattice gauge theories. Uh, I try to, to proceed like motivated by the experiments and not the other way around. Um, so I will uh, show the experiment and what's necessary to understand it and then um, you can stop me if anything doesn't make sense. All right, so first of all, uh, what we need for, uh, to get a trapped ion quantum simulator is ions. And how do we do this? Uh, we cannot do it if, uh, with static electric fields because um, by Maxwell's equations, the, the sum of the curvatures of the electric field in all three di directions have to be zero. So if you're dropping it in two directions, in the third one, uh, you are actually pushing your, your ion away. Um, there's two uh, I'm just going to cover two ways to do it. One is the pole trap, where in, in, instead of having a static field, you have an, um, a, 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 a field that oscillates at radio frequency. And then you create a subtle potential that shifts sine every well, uh, microseconds or so. And uh, this confines your particle. Uh, this creates an effective confining potential that keeps your eye in the center of the trap. Um, uh, and then on the other direction, you put a static field. Um, this is one possibility with, uh, with the time varying fields. The other possibility is uh, to add a magnetic field, in which case, so you have an electric quadrupole and then add a magnetic field, and your particle, again, uh, stays confined and describes some cyclotron motion. Um, and this also uh, works to keep your, your charged particles confined in a region of space. Now, um, let me illustrate, uh, once we have the ions, uh, how we build, um, how we encode information in them. Um, I will take the particular example of the calcium-40 ion, my favorite ion, but uh, the pretty much the same ideas apply to any atomic species. Um, so in, in this ion, we have a, a pretty simple electronic structure, at least the relevant levels. So we have, the, this is the ground state. Um, this can be excited on an optical transition in 729 nanometers uh, to the D state, and this, has a natural, this transition has a natural lifetime of about um, one second. So this means that you, that you, and the typical time it takes for a laser pulse to, 
to excite uh, this transition is microseconds. So this gives you a, really a long time to excite this transition, encode your quantum information, and then do operations until your, your um, information is lost via natural uh, decay. Um, so this kind of qubit, which, I will, which is called op an optical qubit, uh, has the advantage that it, uh, you can do relatively simple operations because it, it's all laser pulses. Um, however, you are in the end limited by the natural lifetime of this transition, which is on the order of uh, seconds, depending on the atomic species. Um, and then uh, your two relevant states are, we can call one or zero, or spin up and spin down, are these um, different uh, electronic states of the, of the valence uh, electron of the ion, and you can manipulate them using laser pulses. Uh, does this make sense so far? Yes. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, um, one other variant on this is instead of you using the optical transition as the qubit transition, you just stay in the, in the, here in the ground state and look closer and it turns out that it's uh, split with two different magnetic uh, number states if you apply a magnetic field and then you take these two states, call that your, your spin or your qubit or, or uh, your two level system and uh, you can manipulate this either directly using RF or microwaves, depending on the species, or by shining a, a, a two-photon transition, you, you shine a laser that is detuned with respect to this upper level, and then another one with a different frequency, and then the, such that the sum of these two frequencies covers precisely the frequency difference between this and, and this level. And uh, this allows us to, to manipulate uh, this qubit. This has the big advantage that it, it's not lifetime limited because we're talking about two levels in the same, uh, in the ground state. So this will, uh, in principle, never decay, at least for, for relevant experimental time scales. However, interactions are now less simple because, well, you, first of all, you have to use uh, uh, two laser beams so, uh, instead of one because you need to go up and, and down again. Uh, or, uh, do some microwave manipulation of your, of your atom. But this is also a, a, a very popular alternative to encoding quantum information in, in ions. Okay, uh, so now like to give you an idea of how the things look like, um, you may have, this is a, an Innsbruck type setup where you have a string, a linear string of ions um, trapped in, in, in the pole trap. These are four electrodes where the, the RF uh, electric field is applied. Uh, then you have these end caps where you apply a DC field, uh, come with a um, cooling light, and you have a, a beam with which you can address single ions, and a beam with which you can manipulate the whole string at the same time. And then detect the fluorescence of the ions using a CCD camera. Um, this is another example from the, this time from the Monroe group. Very similar idea, only that they work with a hyperfine um, qubit. So um, they have um, a setup for Raman um, manipulation. It's the same, you can address individual ions and then have an array of PMTs to detect the fluorescence from each individual ion. Um, right, yes. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, you will see later in this talk a, a, a 2D uh, example on a penning trap. Um, 2D crystals are, def and even 3D crystals are possible in, in pole traps, uh, but this requires on the, the, this depends very strongly on the ratio of your confining potentials. So uh, in, in this case, the, the, the ions arrange themselves in a 1D case because the radial confinement is much stronger than the actual confinement. And then you're just pushing, so you have two, two forces at play. The mu mutual Coulomb repulsion between the ions, which makes them spa like, like space each other, and then the external potential, the, the external electric fields, that will make, make them bunch in some direction. So if you're pushing them a lot stronger in the radial direction than in the actual direction, then they will try to spread out in the, in the actual direction and you get a... Now, if you relax one of the radial confinement potentials, then you would get like a, like a zigzag potential, like in 2D, a, a crystal, or then a sort of 
pancake in 2D, and then if you relax the three directions a lot, then you would get a, a three-dimensional crystal, actually. Um, okay, now, um, you come with your laser, and uh, what you need to do to, or in order to, to do manipulations of your qubit is to find uh, you can, uh, the, the right frequency. So if you shine now a laser at the transition, uh, it's resonant with the transition, with the, with the transition frequency of your qubit, then you will excite it um, to the excited state. And uh, now remember that the ion is, uh, and then uh, these are the, what I have marked here with the colors, are the different, the transitions between the different uh, M numbers of the, so remember that each of these levels is Zeeman split, so you have actually not one, but, but uh, 12, well, uh, 10, 12 uh, possible transitions. And these are just the electronic transitions. Now, on top of, of the, the uh, electronic levels of the ion, remember that we, it's sitting in a trap. So it's basically a harmonic oscillator. And it has uh, motion. So a single ion will have uh, one, one motional mode. And then a string of ions will have um, uh, many motional modes. This, by the way, is not a, a video. It's just a, a cartoon of how this looks like. But each of these n n normal modes, um, if now I did has a, a characteristic frequency, and if now I detune my laser by this frequency and, uh, and change it on the ion, uh, it will, the ion will absorb one, uh, one photon and, and, and get excited, and also will absorb uh, or, or, or emit one, or lose one quantum of, of, like, one phonon, one quantum of vibration. And this happens if I tune my, the frequency of my laser to the sidebands, so for the blue sideband, my atom gains one phonon, and for the red side, and it loses one phonon. Uh, and in this way, I can manipulate also the motional state of the ions. And this will be very useful for actually implementing interactions and entanglement, as we'll see later. Okay, now uh, briefly. With the resonant beam, uh, what we can uh, excite our atom from, from the down state to the up state. And, and, and if I uh, scan the length of, of a laser pulse, for instance, I will get a coherent, a coherent population transfer or rabbit flops. So um, this is what happens. Um, and this is how I do, now in, in terms of a Bloch sphere picture, uh, this is how I do uh, X or uh, rotations around the X or Y axis of my Bloch sphere. Just bring uh, population from, from the south pole to the north pole of the sphere. Yes. Good question. This and, and this is a, um, I'm now I'm describing this particular setup, where where we have a, a global beam that that rotates all ions at the same time, plus an addressed beam, and with this, but with this addressed beam, uh, in this setup we restrict ourselves to doing addressed Z operations, uh, for technical reasons, which we can discuss if, if you're interested. But then, um, this, is, uh, this beam is an addressed beam. So um, you, you focus down the, the beam to, to less than the inter-ion uh, distance, so like a waste of two or three microns, uh, and then talk to each ion, uh, and, and you can deflect it using an electro-optical deflector, and uh, decide now I'm going to um, shine my laser on ion 1 or ion 2, etc. But this laser is uh, some 10 megahertz detuned from the, the electronic transition. So I'm not exciting any, any population. I'm not doing rotations around the X or Y axis. But instead, what I'm doing is I'm inducing an AC stack shift, and, uh, so which detunes effectively the, my transition with respect to, uh, from my laser. And now, if I, if I put this energy difference for so, or this detuning for a while while I'm doing my, my laser pulse, then what I get is a phase evolution which is equivalent to a Z uh, rotation around the Z axis of the block sphere. So what I can do with this um, technique is addressed Z operations. So addressed, um, yeah, Z rotations, uh, which is also one of our building blocks. So now um, you might believe me if I tell you that uh, with this global X and Y rotations and this addressed Z rotations, we can implement any local uh, unitary we would like to. And what we're missing is the interesting part, which are interactions. And for that, we need the motional modes. So one, one way of, of implementing uh, interactions or, or making entanglement 
uh, is this so-called memory surfacing gate, where uh, you couple your so you you do a, a two photon transition. One one will uh, be slightly detuned from a sideband that removes one phonon, and the other one will um, go um, f uh, like, like finish the, the the frequency difference to uh, the state where I have um, two spins up. So then. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm creating entanglement between the, um, the let's say for I have two ions, between the state where I have uh, two spins down and then the state where I flip one spin up and, and add a phonon and the state where I flip the other spin up and add uh, a phonon or I remove a phonon and so on. And then what I get in the end, if you go through the math, is uh, constructive interference uh, along these four paths in such a way that um, the coupling strength is independent of the phonon number, of the yes, of the phonon number, and um, and you have this gate that creates entanglement um, uh, between um, the spin degrees of freedom and the motional degrees of freedom. Now, if you time this gate carefully in such a way that that you make a full circle in, in phase space, let's say you, you time your your gate to be a multiple of the trap frequency, then you will have created no entanglement with the motional degrees of freedom, and what we are, you're left with is a, an effective spin-spin interaction, uh, which will, so you are connecting now uh, the state down-down and up-up, uh, so what you, you get actually is a sigma x, sigma x type of interaction. And this is the type of interaction that happens between all possible pairs of uh, ions in your system. So it's, it's, a long, it's an infinite range interaction, uh, which has its pros and its cons. Uh, was there a question? Or? Um, so a very important thing is, so what we're doing here is a, a pairwise interaction between all possible ions, and now say we just want to, to make a, a, a nearest neighbor interaction, like, a, like to implement a C0 gate between two, uh, two qubits. Um, then what we're going to do is uh, we're going to decouple um, some ions from this interaction. And this we can do by, for instance, th this is our normal qubit transition. Um, we can bring uh, coherently the population from here, uh, from this state to this state via a laser pulse, you know, like a, a pi pulse uh, resonant with this frequency. Now we bring the population from this state to down here and then up here. And now we still, we, everything we did was coherent. Uh, we now have our quantum information encoded in, in these two states here. And now if we come and apply our uh, memory generation gate on the usual transition, uh, this ion that we have hidden will not uh, participate in the interaction because there's nothing here. So in this way, we can apply this decoupling scheme on particular ions in our chain and get them out from the interaction in such a way that we can decide, oh, now we're going to make an entangling interaction only on ions, whatever. One, two, and three out of four. And this now, uh, together with the previous operations, is uh, what you call a complete set of gates in that a sequence of, of such uh, gates can generate any quantum, any unitary evolution you would like. Uh, all you need is, is arbitrary local operations plus some powerful enough entangling operation, and that's it. Yes. Define scalable. Yes. Yes. Um, Probably not. So uh, this, this scheme, so this is a very good question. Your say you have whatever, 10 atoms in your register or 40 atoms in your register. This is still something that, that, that you can do. Now, um, such long range uh, interactions, if, if you would be talking about like 200 atoms or 1,000 atoms, no, uh, it's not. So you would want in that case to keep your register size uh, small enough, let's say, 10 atoms or, or a couple tens of, of, of ions. And, and then you can do long range interactions here, which will provide you an advantage versus only nearest neighbor interactions. Because if you want to entangle this with this, it's a lot quicker to just do it directly. Um, but then at some point, you have to you know, break down and make your, your device more modular. Um, OK, so uh, decomposing, uh, actually, like, like um, 
you're asking how do I go from, from these building blocks to, to the more complex interactions. Say I want to implement such an interaction for a time delta t, well, I, I, I plug this into some uh, uh, computer code and it tells me uh, this answer and I don't really know why uh, such a, a, a pulse um, sequence reproduces the, the evolution under such a Hamiltonian, uh, but I know uh, that such a uh, decomposition has to exist because this, the set of cases that I have is universal and I can always find a, a brute force way to, to break this down and, and efficiently even, only that the number of gates that I get at the end might be a lot more than the optimal implementation. Well, this is an experimental question of like how, how much time and effort I'm willing to, to spend looking for, for implementations of my, uh, of my unitary operations, uh, but in principle, it's always possible. So this is the power of, of digital quantum computing. Now, if I want to implement any uh, Hamiltonian in nature, I can just break it down into, into pieces that not, don't necessarily commute, um, write down um, the species as a sequence of, of, of gates, of quantum gates that I can implement as laser pulses, and then apply enough of them uh, until I implement the evolution under the whole Hamiltonian. Whether this is experimentally feasible or not is a different question, but the, 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 the way, so conceptually, the way is straightforward. Yes? Yeah, so yes, so um, the, the time here, just take it as a, as a, as a free parameter. Um, and, and this, by this figure, I don't mean anything in particular more than, than this is possible. So what I, my, um, my notation here is Z is a rotation around the Z axis, you know, this, this addressed uh, Z rotations of, of angle pi over two. Uh, X is a rotation about the a glo a collective rotation around the X axis. Like yeah, can you repeat the question? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, no, no. Uh, um, I, it means I need to. So this is um, um, perhaps. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if, if you're not very familiar with the circuit. Um, sorry, sorry is, is any, like, who, who is familiar with the circuit notation of, of, okay, not everyone, well, my bad. Uh, I, I will try to, then I will spend a, a minute on, the, on this because it's, it's uh, quite important. Um, each line here represents a qubit, so one, one of my ions. Um, and then each box here is a gate, that I, an operation that I applied on, on, this, on this qubit. And now this, for instance, is a rotation around uh, Z of, of length pi over two. Then it doesn't matter what happens in the meantime, physically speaking, I can wait or not, but I'm doing, ideally I'm doing nothing. And then after doing this, I do a rotation of all three qubits around X, and again, like with an angle of pi over two. And then I entangle them uh, with an MS gate of, of, uh, with a fully entangling uh, memory sequencing gate. And, and, and then I apply this, this rotation of length delta t over two, where delta t is just a, a, a par some free parameter. So ideally, in such a notation, uh, between the boxes, nothing happens. Uh, in, in such a notation, I'm not saying exactly what I'm doing in the lab. Of course, in the lab, I have like a pulse and then a waiting time. And, and these waiting times may be important for the experiment. In, in this notation, I'm just saying what happens to the, to the qubits. Sorry, could you speak up a bit? Yes, um, in, in, in such a... In, in, in such a, um, an architecture, we usually work, like in, in, in the digital way where we apply like sequences of gates, we usually work with I don't know, at most 14 ions, uh, 16 perhaps. Uh, if you are abandon the circuit model, then you can do a couple of tens of ions, let's say 30, perhaps 40, and, and then there's experimental constraints on, on how many ions you can work with. One of them being like how many, like you, you can only confine, the more ions you have, you need to confine them more, more strongly, and at some point uh, they just, uh, um, will try to escape through the ends of, the, of your trap. Then the, the, the spectrum of your, so I showed you some, a picture for one ion where, you sh where I showed the electronic transitions plus the, the sidebands. And at some point this just becomes too crowded. 
So um, it, it's, um, it, it's very hard to, to avoid uh, unintentionally exciting some additional motion modes. So all of this restricts the number of qubits that you can physically have in your trap. And at some point, you will need to split your, your architecture into smaller traps where you have some tens of ions and then find a way to connect them. Um, yes. Yes, yes, the, so in, in, this is true in general for, uh, uh, for, for, um, uh, for a universal set of gates, but it says nothing about the efficiency. Now, in, in, the trot, in this um, in digital quantum simulation scheme, where, where you can decompose uh, like two non-commuting terms into a sequence of, of like stroboscopic uh, terms, then the error of your approximation uh, depends, is proportional to the time step uh, squared, of course, because the, the longer your time step, the, the, the more error you commit, and the, the commutator of your terms. And you mean in, 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 you mean in, the, in the experiment, or? Yes. Um, Right, uh, okay, no, there is no time evolution between the, th this is, a, uh, I mean, so this is a great thing about um, trapped ions. You, the only interactions or, or, or rotations pa happen while you are doing a laser pulse. When you turn off your laser pulse, of course the, so you have these two states, right? And, and the, the, they are separated by some optical frequency, so like some tens of, uh, hundreds of terahertz. And then, of course, the, the, the actual two-level system is rotating at, uh, at hundreds of terahertz. But the whole physics hap for the whole physics, you, you stand in the rotation frame, of, like in, in the, so in the rotation frame, so you're asking, okay, like, now I, I stand on, on the natural rotation frequency of the, of the qubit, what happens now? And, all the, these manipulations happen in, in this frame where the only deviation you have from this natural um, uh, oscillation are when, when you are either like apply a laser pulse that, that rotates you or that, that makes some, some frequency difference in, in such a way that now you are uh, defaced with respect to this rotating frame. But in the rotating frame, uh, nothing at all happens when you turn off your laser pulses. Yes. How do you prepare the states? Um, by a sequence of gates. So say I want to, so the easiest state to prepare is where all the, say all the spins are down, right? I mean, that, that, that's, I can do with, with laser cooling. And let, let, let's say I have prepared that. Now let's say I want to make a, prepare an initial state where every second spin is like an anti -ferro, like a ferromagnetic state, right? And then what I will do is I address each individual ion that I want to rotate. I will put uh, a face, and then uh, I will use my global rotation beam to, so one, uh, perhaps this is better explained by. Um, this is uh, now a bit involved, but, but say I have I have prepared this and I want to flip every second spin. What I do is first apply some X uh, rotation around pi over two, which will bring all my ions here, right? Now I address these two and, and do uh, a Z on ion two of pi and a Z of pi on ion four of pi, which will now, uh, so it's a rotation around the z-axis, right? So now this will be like this, and I flip this two on this plane, and now finally I do another x pi over two. And, it, and now I finish rotating down, so this is down, this is up, this is down, and this is up. So this is, this is how you would, for instance, prepare uh, such a state by a sig by a carefully chosen sequence of, of uh, these elementary gates. You, you, 
you can prepare any. Yeah, so, so for, I mean, but, uh, so, um, uh, it, it is determinist, completely deterministic. So by, 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 by this, I mean, uh, by, by this, I mean something like this, right? So it's a, a, a coherent superposition of up and down. Um, so you, the, the whole post manipulation here is deterministic and coherent. It's all unitary operations. So every laser pulse is a unitary gate. So um, to create a superposition, you apply a Hadamard gate, so a, 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 next, a rotation of pi over two, which will put you in a superposition of up plus, up plus down. If you change the face of your laser pulse, then you will be in up plus i down, or up minus i down, you can trust the faces. And then if you apply entangling gates, then you prepare entangled states. Yes? It is. Uh, let me not get into that now, but I can point you to references. Uh, it is a bit more, more involved. It, it, it requires the use of, of non of non-unitary uh, lab techniques, like for instance, uh, laser cooling or, or pumping, like, like something that involves, usually something, it has to be something that involves spontaneous decay uh, or something non-unitary going on. Th these processes that I described here are all uh, unitary. Okay, um, and then finally, after I do all my, my experiments, I do the measurement, which is, uh, and this technique is known as electron shelving, I, whoop, I shine a laser on my um, resonant with the transition from this ground state to some other excited state, a P state, and then if the atom is in, uh, in, in the S state, then it will get excited and decay back and emit fluorescence, and so if I look at it with CCD camera, I see light, and if it's on, in this dark state here, since this is not connected by, to any other state on this frequency, then nothing happens, it doesn't emit fluorescence, and I see uh, no light coming from the ion. Uh, and then if I have a string of ions, I can do this procedure and, and get a picture of the whole string of ions, and um, I will get something like this, where I say I have eight ions, and, and some will be in the up state, some will be on the down state. This is a projective measurement, so I, I do a, an experimental sequence, do, make such an experiment, and then see what the state of the ions is, repeat a hundred times to gather statistics, and this is what tells me my quantum state. And I think we already covered this, like, uh, of course, at some point, like, this breaks down for many ions, and you need to uh, break down the size of your register into, into smaller pieces. There's a couple alternatives for this, like uh, planar traps, where, where you have uh, different trapping registers, and then you can shuttle your ions around and, and make them interact, or um, you just split your, um, your architecture into little uh, ion traps and then try to connect them via photon interfaces. These are all uh, fields of research in, in under very active investigation, but for the moment, let us restrict ourselves to experiments that fit in one ion trap. Okay, so this, yes. Um, so, as, as we were discussing some minutes ago, some of it has to do with the confinement of your ions. So, if you want to, to put a hundred ions there, then they have Coulomb repulsion, right? So, so, they will try to form a longer crystal, and at some point you need to, they will start escaping from the ends of your trap. So, you need to increase the confining potential. Now, if you increase the confining potential along Z, then they will try to, like, escape on, along X and Y. So then you, you push more on X and, along X and Y, and at some point you just cannot confine anymore, forming a crystal. They, they will just, uh, you can keep them confined, but they will form a cloud, and then you will not be able to individually address and manipulate them. This is one problem. Another problem is that the, the, with 100 ions, you have a 300 motional modes. Each of them has a frequency close to your, your electronic transition. And then if your laser light is not perfectly uh, uh, monochromatic, the, um, or if you have some, some other higher harmonics, then you will excite this, this um, emotional frequencies um, unwillingly, and this is bad because you will heat up your ion chain. These are two problems that, that, that limit you in principle. Yes? Uh, 
it's a good question. Um, I would say not 50 because uh, when you get to 50, you, you all have a number of technical problems that do not allow you to. Uh, I mean, it's not a fundamental limitation, but let's say state of the art, practical state of the art. For 10 qubits, we can do the kind of stuff that I was describing, yes. For 50 qubits, no, we can do the kind of stuff that I will show you right now. Um, but yes, for less than 10 qubits, we, we have such a, a level of control. Now, of course, you know, like in this case, uh, the, the next question is, okay, like you say you do a pi over two rotation, but is it really a pi over two rotation or is it like slightly off? Well, it's slightly off, right? Because there's a lot of experimental uh, errors that, that pile up. And so the fidelity of your gates is not 100%. It's something like 99.99% for, for single qubit gates and 99.9% and for, for entangling gates. And that's pretty close to the state of the art in any uh, quantum processing architecture. We, we don't, in, in, in the experience that I'm going to show, there is no quantum regression going on. Uh, quantum regression has been demonstrated with, with such, uh, with such uh, systems, but at the moment, for the kind of experience that I'm going to demonstrate, the, the, over, so the, the infidelity of each gate is such that implementing quantum error correction, which requires you to do more correction pulses, actually hurts you more than it helps you. Uh, you first need to get the, your errors below some threshold so that uh, uh, quantum regression starts to help you. All right. Um, yes. Uh, sorry, can, can you? Wait, wait, wait. Like in, in case of 50, 50 ions, yes. do the quantum states, they still hold for like seconds or does it decrease to like? The lifetime yeah, stays. Microsecond. So the li uh, that's a good question. The lifetime of, a, of, an, of an N ion chain, the, I mean, the state is preserved as long as none of your N ions decays, right? And each of them takes a second to decay. And now if, if you consider the, the probability that neither of us, so this is a, a Poisson process. So like, like if you wait, let's say one second, uh, and the probability that one ion decays is say 50%, and the probability that, that, no, that neither of two ions decays is 25%, and the probability that no three ions uh, decays is one, one half to the power of three, and so on. So, um, so yes, like the more ions you have, the, the, the more you will be affected by this uh, decay process. Because you want that none of your, of your qubits decay in, in, in a given time window. And the same for coherence times, actually. Like, uh, usually for, for many kinds of states, the, the coherence time goes as 1 over n squared. So, so the more, like actually it's like quadratically bad in the number of ions. Okay, so perhaps we can, I don't know, how do you feel? Would you like to make a five minute break or move on? Raise your hands for a five minute, no, less your hands for move on. I see slightly less than half, so let's make a five minute break. <laughs> and. The lifetime decay very fast, right? Like as the system scales up. So is it the bottle to the uh, what's the bottleneck for to scale this thing up? Of the so uh, still on the mic. So at the moment we're not limited. Yeah, thank you. I hope Martilla doesn't hear me.
I, I, yeah. I, I figure that. All right, shall we get started? Um, so, Async models. Um, this is the, the most, uh, probably most popular model we have for, for uh, ferromagnetism. And you have uh, some d-dimensional uh, system of, of spins that, that are Interacting with some uh, sigma x sigma x interaction, so so something that that makes my spins uh, rotate around the the x axis, and then I have an additional uh, magnetic field, let's say along the z direction. So now, if I only had the the x x interaction, my spins would be um, aligned in uh, like in, in a in a in a ferromagnetic uh, state. Uh, along the x um, direction. If I only had the magnetic field pointing in this, this direction, all my spins would be uh, anti-aligned with the magnetic field. And the question is now, what happens if I turn both terms at the same time? And then I get some interesting physics. And uh, that's the whole point of, of this experiment, to understand better uh, what's going on here. Now, I will hear you say, yeah, but the, uh, the Ising model uh, you can uh, solve analytically in one dimension, even in two dimensions. Yes, sure, but you have to start somewhere. And uh, by the way, if you go to three, it's actually um, a very difficult problem, computationally speaking. Um, so it's a, a pretty worthwhile uh, problem to investigate. Um, right. So and in, in now in in this half an hour or so, I will uh, try to cover experiments from these three papers. I, I try to keep things uh, even and, and discuss a paper from from the Monroe Group from 2011, and then a paper from um, sorry from NIST, and then uh, a paper from Rainer Blatt's group in, in Innsbruck. Um, all right, so. We need a way to implement, so um, we have these two terms in the Hamiltonian. Uh, the, the rotation, so this is a, a, a magnetic field around sigma z, which in the Hamiltonian is a rotation around uh, the z axis. We know how to do this with ions, right? This is just a, 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 a far detuned laser beam that will make an SC stack shift. This we saw before the break. And now we need to figure out how to make these interactions. But we already saw also how to make a sigma x, sigma x interaction. We just need to use the emotional uh, decrease of freedom of the ions and um, cup, couple uh, the spin decrease of freedom to the emotional decrease of freedom. Now, um, let me illustrate, but this is, is pretty similar to what we discussed before the break. So we have, uh, this is the electronic transition that, that flips my spin from down to up. These are all my, my sidebands that correspond to to acquiring uh, uh, phonons in, in each of these uh, motional, different motional modes. If I had n ions, then I will have three n uh, uh, motional modes. And uh, if now I cool down my ion to the ground state, then all my, my red sidebands disappear because I cannot subtract any more um, phonons from the system. And now I can shine uh, um, uh, two lasers at the same time. This is just like the smelmer sensor gate we saw before. We are off resonant with respect to this motional degrees of freedom. And effectively, we couple uh, our spins from, let's say, from, from going from down down to down up and, and adding one phonon, and then to up up and, and removing one phonon again. So effectively, we, are, uh, we have this sigmax sigmax interaction. And now the funny part is that um, the, the strength of this interaction, remember, is mediated by this motional degrees of freedom. So each of these lines correspond to, to one uh, particular mode, be like a com mode or, or some breathing mode or something like that. And now the strength of interactions depends, of course, on the 
uh, involvement of each of the individual ions in this motional mode. If one of the ions, uh, um, so in, in some modes, for instance, the ions will do like this, and then the center ion will be static, which means that for this mode, the ion is not participating at all, and if I shine a laser closely tuned uh, to this mode, then this ion will not get entangled at all because it's not even participating in the motion. So then, if I now consider, uh, like, consider a far detuned uh, laser beam and start counting all the different modes of my chain, for instance, the center of mass mode is uniform along this, this um, the string, and, and so I have a constant positive coupling between all ions, which gives me an antiferral magnetic coupling, you know, like positive couplings of infinite range. Now, I have a tilt mode, which, uh, where half of the ions interact with one sign and half with the other sign, which gives me a, a coupling that is uh, ferromagnetic uh, of the diagonal and, and antiferromagnetic on the diagonal. And these two, and, and since now I have a laser that is off resonance, then it's coupled to both of these modes, so I have to sum them up. And here is uh, what I get when I sum them up. Now I start considering all the high order contributions. And at the end, what I get is an antiferromagnetic um, interaction whose strength decreases with distance. And the, the strength of this interaction and then its decay with distance depends on how far I detune my laser from the mode. So if I'm very close, so if I'm very far away, then uh, you can show that this interaction decreases with a distance cubed. And if I'm very close to the, for instance, to the center of mass mode, then since the center of mass mode is completely uniform across the whole string, it's just all the ions doing the same, then the, the range of my interaction is infinite. And, and then it decays as one over distance to the power of zero. And in between, for, uh, you, you have a range of detunings, and then you will get different power laws for how this, the strength of this interaction decays along the chain. And uh, this is now the, 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 the power that you have with such experiments that you can, by just changing how far you detune this laser, you can engineer the range of your uh, easing interactions. And, and you get very uh, different physics depending on, on what's this uh, power law that dictates how your, your interactions decay. Does this make sense? Because this is the building block for what we're going to see next. OK. Um, so now let's move on to the first experiment. Um, so we have a, a, a pole trap, uh, very similar to the one I, I showed you already. We have a, a chain of ions. Uh, now, in this particular experiment, we have a hyperfine qubit. So uh, the difference with respect to the, to the gate I showed you before is th that this is two Raman beams. But really, the uh, um, conceptually is all the same. The, the difference of frequency of these Raman beams uh, gets, you, you put it, the, close or far detuned from these motional sidebands, and then you can engineer the, um, the range of your interaction by detuning the, the bit node of these two beams closer or further away from your motional frequencies. Um, so the flow of the experiment is first you prepare um, your spins in, a, in an eigenstate of the, of the magnetic field along the y-axis, and then you turn on the, uh, the X interaction, which means turning on these Raman beams, and ramp down adiabatically the magnetic field up to some final value, B. And then, so you start with the ground state, then you, uh, you turn on the interactions and ramp down the magnetic field, and uh, hopefully during the whole time, you st if you do things slowly enough, you stay in the ground state. So at the end, you are preparing your chain in the ground state of the system that has both a field and the interactions. Uh, this is the, um, um, be because you did things uh, slow enough, then the system always remains in its ground state. Uh, this is a so-called uh, adiabatic theorem. You probably heard about that. Um, and then you can study, okay, like what's the, the final state that I reach as a function of the m final magnetic field that I reach. Um, Right, so then uh, you can uh, detune the laser by, by a different amount and um, see how the interactions uh, decay with distance. This is a theoretical uh, uh, plot for the interaction strength. And uh, here in the experiment, um, 
since in this particular experiment they couldn't study correlations between the, uh, the ions because they, they only measure the total light coming from the ions, you can measure, uh, for instance, magnetization, which is counting how many spins are up, which uh, means how many spins are bright, uh, how many ions are bright at the moment of, of making a projective measurement, uh, or higher orders of the, uh, of the magnetization, like this uh, G function, which is basically just a measure of the correlations in the, in the chain. It's defined here as, uh, as a function of the number of spins up. And then this is an order parameter for your system, and you expect to have a phase transition uh, for a large um, system size. As you decrease the, the um, magnitude of the magnetic field, you expect your spins to uh, become more ordered in the direction of your interaction. And this is precisely what, uh, so this is the, the theoretical expectation. You expect the, uh, actually with the, in the magnetization you have a second order phase transition, which means that the uh, derivative of this will be discontinuous uh, for, for an infinite size system. And then in, if you study this correlation function, you expect actually a, a sharper um, uh, transition. So this is a, a more sensitive uh, measurement. And then you see how the transition should become sharper as you increase the number of uh, the sizes of your system, uh, because then you, you are getting closer to the thermodynamic limit. And, and here is, are the experiments to compare. And you see indeed that as you reduce the value of this final magnetic field, um, both in the magnetization and in the, the in this correlation function, you see how, uh, first of all, the system becomes more ordered. So the value of this order parameter increases. And also that how the transition becomes sharper for larger system sizes. Here, they are comparing uh, two ions versus nine ions. So that's all I want to say about this experiment, uh, which I think was one of the first um, uh, to, st uh, to study such spin models in, uh, with trapped ions. Now I want to show another neat experiment where they do use a very similar technique, but in using two-dimensional di crystals in a panning trap. So remember here that the ions are, are ro so you have a mag magnetic field, so the ions are continuously rotating at a frequency of uh, uh, some, some uh, 40 kilohertz. And uh, just as before, you can apply uh, two laser fields um, whose frequency is detuned uh, so uh, with respect to each other by uh, some, some magnitude. And uh, you can tweak this, this detuning uh, to get exactly uh, as before, uh, to regulate the, the strength of the, of the interactions that is induced. So this is a, a theoretical, uh, th this is in theory how all the, the normal modes of the string look like, you know, from, from a center of mass mode to, uh, to all these drum-shaped uh, uh, eigenmodes of the crystal. And here is where you, so you have um, oscillation frequencies on the order of uh, hundreds of kilohertz, and here is what you, where you place, uh, where you will detune the, the bead node of your, of your lasers. And by changing this, uh, this detuning mu r, um, you get a different uh, power loss for the decay of the interaction strength as a function of the spin-spin separation. Uh, and, and here you can see the geometry of, uh, of these interactions. For instance, for the, for the case where, this, uh, where the detuning is very, very small, then your power law is almost a constant, so A is almost equal to zero. And, and then the interaction is the same between all ions. And as you increase your detuning, then you have, uh, approach this asymptotical uh, inverse cubed law where uh, the, the strongest interaction is with the nearest neighbors, and then it decays um, as one over distance cubed. Okay, so this is what you expect. And now you can actually go to the lab and benchmark uh, these interactions by uh, first preparing uh, some spin state, rotating it a bit, and, and then turning on the interaction and letting it proceed uh, around the, the Z axis, what you get is actually uh, a mean field effect. And then studying the amplitude of these oscillations and, and how much or how fast you are proceeding depends on the strength of interaction. So now you can change the detuning uh, of your laser, which is on the x-axis here, and study how fast your spins are proceeding. And this gives you a magnitude of the strength of interaction. 
and see indeed how it decays uh, according to the right um, power law. Okay, so now that we have these elements in place, uh, I would like to, to introduce one more element, which is what if now we can take uh, pictures of our ions and, and actually study correlations, uh, then I could um, resolve individual um, quantum systems, and not only along the z direction, but also along the x direction. If I first rotate uh, my, my ions by, by pi over two around x, for instance, and then measure along z, then I'm, I'm actually measuring, uh, measuring the, the, the x uh, component of the spin. So then I can measure any correlation that I want between ions in the same shot. I just take, do a one-shot measurement, and I see if, if, for instance, the ions are anti-correlated or correlated, and so on, which I cannot do with just uh, aggregating the, the, the brightness of all the ions coming at the same time. Okay, so then how can I characterize my, my, my interaction? Well, I can prepare one, state, one ion in, 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 this, in a spin up and there on a spin down, switch on my interaction, which will flip um, spin up down to down up, because that, this is what the sigma x, sigma x interaction does, and then the strength of interaction is given by the, the flopping speed uh, of these two states, or, or the rabbit frequency of these oscillations, and I can now plot this for every pair of ions and uh, characterize the coupling matrix, and you see how it decays with, uh, with distance, like the, the, the nearest neighbors interact the most strongly, and then f uh, and the further away removed you, you get, you get this power law uh, decrease. And having characterized this, then you, you can make very neat experiments, such as um, you, you prepare your, your, your chain in, in, in a state where all the ions are, are pointing down, and then you excite one, one atom, um, or one sp you flip one spin, turn on your interactions, and what this will do is, okay, the, the, now your spin will start flipping over with, with the neighboring spins, and, and this has some correlation length, and uh, you expect then to create entanglement uh, between the spins at some rate that will depend on uh, uh, the strength of your, of your interaction. So the, the, f the more long range your interactions are, uh, which is here, then the faster your creations spread. You see here, this, uh, what I'm plotting here is the, uh, the, the excitation of these of this ions, whereas for, for, sh for for shorter range interactions, uh, the, the propagation of these correlations is slower because you first have to flip the neighboring spins, then the, the nearest neighboring, the, the second nearest, and so on. So you see how this speed of propagation depends on the range of interactions, which is uh, something um, that is also of, of, um, of theoretical interest. What's the, the say that the speed, the speed at which, uh, the speed of sound or, or, or the speed at which uh, information can be propagated in, in under such in interactions. And then see also, if you look at it, uh, not just uh, spins flipping, but entanglement, how entanglement propagates along the system such that at the beginning, for instance, spins three and five are completely unentangled, and then at some point, uh, this entanglement wave comes through them, and then they get entangled, and then disentangled again, and so spins two and six and one and seven, they get entangled mutually uh, at increasingly longer times. Yes? Just for the so, uh, the, let's say the, the, the half of this paper is precisely comparing uh, such, such bounds. I, I will, like for the details, I will refer you to the, to the paper, but uh, yes, the, um, basically the, the idea is to, to, to relate the, the range to, to, to the, to the uh, Robinson bound. Um, well, so I mean, you could probably see, look, if by localization you mean localization due to disorder, you could probably see it, but not in this case because this is a very ordered system. Um, so in, in this case I would not speak of localization. I mean, your initial state is localized because that's the initial state you prepare, you know, like a, a perfectly localized excitation. And then what you have is the um, 
Um, actually, perhaps this makes a bit more sense uh, if we look at uh, in this picture. So you can either look at it in, in terms of, of the individual sites, um, and then you excite one, one ion, uh, one spin, and, and then uh, you, you see how this uh, localized excitation propagates. Or you can think of it in terms of quasi-particles, of like n normal uh, modes in the system, and then the eigenstates of your Hamiltonian are not individual um, excitations, but uh, delocalized uh, spin waves, right? So uh, you, you basically, you have uh, um, modes where, for instance, uh, the, the, the middle uh, spins are the ones uh, most excited, and then it decays towards the ends, uh, modes where you have a node in the middle, uh, and so on, towards a, a zigzag uh, state where, where one ion is spin up, and there is spin down, and so on. These are the actual eigenstates stage of the system. And so another different way to, to look at it is to say, okay, like actually when I excite uh, one ion, say I have here, I excite one ion, and then I turn on my interaction. Well, if I decompose this one ion excitation in terms of the, of the natural uh, quasi-particle basis of the system, then this is just uh, some superposition of all these uh, quasi-particles. So I'm exciting all these normal modes of the, or, or spin waves. And, and then, uh, at some point, uh, what I will see is uh, just the, the effect of all these um, uh, quasi-particles being excited at their natural frequencies, which are given, by the, again, by the strength of the interaction. So the question is, okay, like now uh, how can I characterize the, these quasi-particles, so these this, uh, spin waves in my, in my system? Uh, one way to do it is precisely this. I excite one ion let it interact so that it, all the, the modes get excited. Now uh, bring it back to the, to the ground state and um, detect at the end the excitation of all the ions. And measure that as a function of time. So then I have here for, for the seven ions in, in my chain, as a function of time, um, the, 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 the population, so the excitation, uh, or, or the, the expectation value of the, of the spin along uh, the z direction or the x direction. And this forms some time trace. And then if I now Fourier transform this time trace, uh, and I prepare uh, my, my initial state in something that is close enough to the, to the eigenmodes of the system, so the, to these quasi-particles, say for instance that I prepare my state in something that looks roughly like this. It doesn't need to be exactly the, the eigenstate of the system. But I prepare my, my system, I excite these ions a bit, and this spins a bit more, and, and, and the middle the most, and no nodes in the middle. Then if I project this onto the true, proper eigenstates of my system, uh, I have quite a considerable component there, and when I evolve and Fourier transform, I see a peak at, uh, appearing at some, at some frequency, which is the frequency of this uh, eigenmode. And then I can, because I know how r roughly how the eigen modes look like, I can create a state with one node and two nodes and so on, and so I can repeat with a different initial configuration and uh, study all the, the the peaks that appear in my in my spectrum just by fully transforming the time evolution. What this tells me now, if I create a superposition of say the k equals one and k equals seven um, modes, is the frequency difference uh, between these two modes. And now I can plot, uh, so, so I'm, I'm doing spectroscopy of these uh, quasi-particles. And now we can plot the, the, the frequency uh, as a function of the, of the k number, and I get the dispersion relation. So I, I'm, I'm understanding now uh, how qu these quasi-particles propagate in my system um, just by doing this, this Ramsey spectroscopy uh, technique, uh, which is a really a, a very powerful uh, tool. So, um, Right, so um, with this, uh, I have said all I wanted to say now about um, simulations of um, spin models, I mean, of the icing model in, in, in particular. Uh, I hope uh, that I could convince you that uh, you can study st things like, like phase transitions, you can uh, characterize uh, and, and manipulate the range of interactions by, by doing very, using very simple experimental tools like detuning lasers. Uh, that you can perform spectroscopy uh, of, of your of your quasi particles, 
Uh, you can study entanglement in your, in your system. You can study uh, velocity of uh, propagation of information, this Lib Robinson bounds. Uh, there's really a lot of, of uh, information um, about your, your, your spin model that you can very readily access by these very simple uh, and now mainstream experimental tools. Um, and so this is the, the analog approach. You know, you, you have some, some model, that, that, uh, like the Ising model, uh, that you want to study. You, you figure out, OK, uh, in the lab, if I turn on this bichromatic uh, beam, and at the same time, enough resonant beam, then I have exactly the same um, Hamiltonian as the one I'm trying to simulate. That's great. Uh, but this is not, you, I cannot repeat this trick for, for every possible Hamiltonian because at some point, if, my, if the physics that I'm trying to study are complicated enough, I will have nothing in the lab that, that actually completely resembles uh, what I'm trying to look at. So um, no, that's what, what I need digital techniques. And that's what I would like to talk uh, in, in this last half an hour. And f as an example, I will um, discuss how to simulate a problem in particle physics. Um, uh, and, and the model we are going to look at is uh, so-called lattice gauge theories. Uh, so um, studying gauge theories on a discretized on a, on a lattice. But I, I will just uh, say what, the, what I mean by this in a, in a second. So to, to be a bit uh, impressive. Uh, you know, like in, in, in CERN, uh, they build this uh, multi-billion dollar uh, particle accelerators to, to figure out the new physics. No one's trying to, to leave CERN out of work. Uh, but I would like to make the contrast that um, you can study the same kind of physics both with, with this multi-billion, uh, many kilometer machine and a humble, very tiny ion trap. Uh, with the difference that in, in here you can actually go and, and, and discover the, the actually what's the Hamiltonian of my system. You know, you, you, you come here and, and figure out what's the Lagrangian of, the, of your particle physics. And then once you know the equations of motion, uh, you can um, come to your quantum computer or quantum simulator, program them, and see what comes out, which is a non-trivial problem as well. Yes? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so this is a, a, a view uh, through a window of a vacuum tr trap. The vacuum, like the vacuum chamber, the vacuum chamber. The vacuum chamber looks more or less like this. Has four windows to the sides. This particular one, uh, it's an, an ultra high vacuum. So this is 10 to the minus 11 millibar, um, which you need because otherwise the ions will collide with background gases and, and get kicked out of the trap. So the ion lifetime is mostly in the trap, not the, the information, but the actual lifetime of the ion in the trap is mostly limited by background pressure. And with, a good, vacu with good vacuum, you can keep a, an ion trapped for months without it escaping the, the trap. Uh, it's room tem as at room temperature. You can do such experiments in, in cryogenic setups, um, which has advantages when it comes to noise, uh, but it also complicates and, 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 and heating up. But it also complicates your experimental setup quite a bit. Uh, so this particular experiment uh, setup where, where the experiments that I'm going to discuss happened is in at room temperature. Um, else that you would like to know? So, so then, star model. Uh, you know that the, the interactions between, uh, so you have a, a, a a number of elementary particles that uh, describe the matter in your system, and then the interactions between them are described by gauge theories, which are, uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into detail because I don't know the detail, but uh, they are described by, by theories that have certain symmetries, uh, certain mathematical symmetries, and uh, these theor uh, th this theories are, are quantum mechanical theories at heart, so they are um, difficult to simulate with classical computers. And thus comes the, the, the idea, well, perhaps we could simulate them on a quantum computer. And now, uh, so of course, the, the, the long-term vision here is to simulate the stuff that, that is actually, so um, for electromagnetism, for instance, uh, you know that the, the electromagnetic interaction is uh, weak enough that you can treat it perturbatively. And, and there has been huge theoretical success in, in the past 
century uh, in, in, in solving uh, this problem analytically or, 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 or with analytical calculations. Uh, however, if you want to treat um, uh, gauge theories where the, where the couplings are, are strong, like in uh, quantum chromodynamics that studies interactions between uh, quarks and uh, with, the, with the strong uh, nuclear force, then uh, your perturbation theory doesn't work anymore. And then you need to, uh, at, at least for some phenomena, uh, and then you need to uh, do non-perturbative uh, simulations. And one way to, um, to do it, we'll see. Um, however, that's a, the most difficult problem. So ex that's exactly why we're not going to start there. We're going to start, again, by the simplest problem, which is quantum electrodynamics. Show the, and, and show how we can simulate um, this on a quantum computer. Uh, not because this is an unsolvable problem analytically, but rather because uh, this is the first time ever that we are trying to do this, so we might as well start with the, uh, with the first step. Okay, so uh, like a, this is an, an experimentalist uh, view of, of quantum electrodynamics. I have charged particles, electrons, and antiparticles that interact via electromagnetic force fields. Uh, particles and antiparticles can mutually annihilate. Uh, and um, one prediction of this theory is actually that uh, if, I can, if I create a strong enough field, then uh, a non-perturbative effect that happens is that uh, pairs of particles and antiparticles can actually get created out of vacuum uh, fluctuations. Um, and this is a so-called Schwinger mechanism, and it has not been, as far as I am aware, experimentally observed yet. Um, but this is a, a very strong theoretical prediction of the, of the theory. Um, and so, how can I... Okay, so this is the, the conceptually, for, for very simply people like me, uh, the, the view of what we're trying to do, and now how can you uh, simulate uh, such a theory? Okay, so in, in, in reality, uh, you, you would say, uh, I have all these uh, particles um, uh, floating around or interacting. If I want to, to reduce the problem and make it simpler, I can discretize space. And so divide the uh, space into, into little boxes, and each of these boxes can hold uh, one particle or, or one antiparticle. Uh, for simplicity, we're just going to consider one spatial dimension. Okay, and so we have reduced our continuous three-dimensional space to a lattice. And then uh, on each side of this lattice, we have, um, actually, let, let's, let's say we have blue sides and red sides. On the blue sides, we can either have a, a particle or, or no particle, and in the red sides, we can either have an antiparticle or, or nothing. Um, and this is a discretized uh, version of, of, the, of the actual space that we're looking at. And in the limit where uh, we make the spacing uh, of this lattice uh, go to zero, then we recover the continuum version um, of, uh, for, for instance, Dirac's um, equation. This, um, you have to believe me, you go through the math. And uh, you recover quantum electrodynamics in one dimension, just by letting the lattice spacing go to zero. Um, does this make sense so far? Right. So each side then has two possible states, uh, which are to be full or empty, and to encode whether there is, is there a particle there or not. And uh, so then I can encode this uh, in, 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 as a spin model, uh, which is the, the whole point of any quantum simulation usually is to, okay, ha you have some physical problem, try to reduce that to a spin model, you know, a spin of uh, uh, a model where you have spins up and down interacting with some Hamiltonian, and that we know how to write uh, down in our quantum computer. So then, if a side is, uh, has an electron or, or a positron hole, then I'm gonna call it a spin down, and if a side has a positron or an electron hole, then I will call it spin up. It's just two level, have just a two level system per, per side. And then, of course, I have also superpositions. So I encode this in um, each of these uh, sites um, in a qubit, or a two-level system, or a, a spin one half. Does this make sense? Because this is, if this is clear, then the rest follows. Yes. Right. So 
you know that in, so in, in, in the continuum uh, uh, description that, I, so in, in the ideal continuum uh, one dimensional uh, uh, model that we have in mind, then in each point of space we have a, a, a field, right, that has two components, like a, uh, just like in, in three dimensions, you, you have uh, spin up and down, and, and, and then you have the uh, four components of this field per, uh, per, per, per position. So you have a, a, a space-dependent field. In this case, you have a, a space-dependent field that has only this, this um, the, the particle component, let's call it an electron, and the antiparticle component, let's call it an, uh, a positron. And now the a mathematical trick that you do is to split this, uh, now you, you discretize your space such that in, in, in each um, side you have this, this uh, two component field. And then a mathematical trick that you play is that, that you break down your, uh, you break up your, your lattice into even and odd sides and you put the particles or one component of your field in the even sides and the other in the odd sides. Uh, in, in the original Schringer paper they literally say we do this because it works. Uh, so, so in one dimension, uh, let, me, let me say that we, you have no spin actually because there's, I mean, there's just one dimension. So you only have two components. Like, um, so this is a, a case where you have like spinless fermions. And then a step that I'm not, uh, for those of you who are more theoretically inclined, a step that, that I'm pull, uh, putting under the rug is that of course you have fermions, uh, uh, a fermion operator per, per site, and, and here I'm, I'm just drawing spins. What you do in the middle is a uh, jordan Wigner transformation to map these fermion um, operators as, as, as spins, and it turns out that the one-dimensional problem is so nice that he, uh, the presence or absence of, a, like the value of the fermion operator on each side can be mapped directly to the, the expectation value of this spin up or down per site. Uh, but if you don't know and don't care about jordan Wigner transformations, then uh, you can trust me when, when I tell you that uh, it is enough to write down a spin up or down, encoding the presence or absence of a particle or antiparticle per site. Does this make sense? Um, it, it's like the, the, the separate... Basically, when, when you look at it, like if you look at it from far away and, and let the lattice spacing tend to zero, then you would group these two sites into one physical position, space size, right? So, so that you, you ask, okay, like, do I have a particle? And if I have just one particle, then this would be, uh, this would be full and this would be empty. Uh, and, and if I have just one antiparticle, then this would be full and this would be empty and so on. It just, if you look at it from far away. Question? You, well, you don't neglect it. Actually, rigorously speaking, one dimension, you have no spin degree of the yeah, particle. Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, you do, you do the most you can do in one dimension, so, which is admittedly a, a very simple toy model. Um, does this encoding make sense? Because this is like pretty much the, the last conceptually complicated thing that is to come. Okay, uh, anyways, you can stop me later. So now, um, once we have this, this spin chain, we also, on top of this, we have interactions, which again uh, are given by the, the, uh, the gauge fields. So the way we encode this is we put a gauge field on the links between the sides, which is the electric field, and uh, the expectation value of this, peel, of this field um, um, on, the, on the links between the sides is the, uh, the strength of the electric field um, between the, at one particular uh, site in, in space. And then the effect of this uh, L, um, gauge field without writing down any equations is that a neighboring pair of particles and antiparticles can get created or destroyed. And then since I have to respect uh, Gauss's law, uh, if, if I destroy a particle antiparticle pair, then I also have to remove one unit of flux, of electric flux between them, uh, just to, to keep the balance of charges and fields constant. Okay, so that, uh, and, and now uh, a nice trick we can play is that if we know the boundary conditions of the electric field, say the field is zero here, then I know that I go through a minus one charge, so the electric field is worth minus one, then I go through a plus one charge, so it's zero again, zero, 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 minus one again. So by knowing the boundary conditions and the distribution of matter in my system, so the charges, 
I know the field everywhere. So I can trace it out. Um, and what I do when I trace it out um, is I, I get an effective, so I, I have removed all the sketch fields and I'm, are left with, I'm left with an effective uh, spin uh, Hamiltonian where I have these long range interactions that come from having eliminated the gauge fields. And um, if you look a bit, uh, and the, the shape that these things have is that the interaction of a spin with the ones to its left is constant, which makes sense because uh, this interaction was just given by removing the, the, like by propagating the boundary conditions. And to the right, it decays linearly or, or increases linearly depending on the sign. And this is exactly uh, the form that Coulomb law has uh, in, in one dimension. It's a, um, a linear, so the, the, the potential of a, of a point charge in, in one dimension is um, the potential increases linearly and the electric field is constant up to infinity. And this is just how electron, electrodynamics in one dimension looks like. Uh, so we do nothing strange here. We just recover electrodynamics in one dimension from eliminating our quantum gauge fields. But the whole treatment is still quantum. And now the, the physics of my problem. Yes. Um, yeah, it is. Right. Uh, uh, yes, it is an appearance. You do retrieve the exact same results if you, if you start from the left or from the right. Uh, it's not immediately obvious, but you do. So, I mean, the, the procedure, so the physics is left to right invariant. The procedure that you do to, to, to eliminate your, your gauge fields is not, like, you have a, a, you break the symmetry somehow. So then you end up writing a Hamiltonian uh, that, uh, that is not left to right, and that is asymmetric, which, which I agree with you is like super anti-intuitive, counterintuitive. But if, if then you see, look at the physics that this Hamiltonian describes, uh, and they are the same uh, how you started from the left as how you started from the right. Um, right, so then the dynamics that is going on in this model is, uh, first of all, I have this creation annihilation, uh, uh, I can create or annihilate neighboring pairs, which is our, our intuitive idea of electrons coming together with positrons and annihilating each other. Then uh, particles are, have mass, so it takes energy to create uh, particles. It's another term in the Hamiltonian, the, the self-energy given by the mass of the particles. And finally, I have this long-range, exotic, asymmetric interactions coming from eliminating the, the, the gauge fields. Uh, which is the Coulomb interaction. And this is exactly the kind of interaction that would be impossible to do in an analog uh, uh, simulation because this is a, a very asymmetric, counterintuitive, uh, looks very artificial. It is what comes out of our, of our mapping. But this is something that you would never go to the lab and find naturally a kind of physical interaction that has this shape. So that's why, why digital simulation is great because now we know that these are the three terms that we have to simulate. So this sigma plus, sigma minus uh, interaction that flips neighboring qubits, plus long range uh, sigma set, sigma set interactions, which have these coefficients that decay linearly to one side and stay constant to the other side, so a very, a very like, exotic thing, uh, plus um, uh, sigma set uh, terms which correspond to the particle masses. But each term in this interaction, we know how to do, because for instance, this sigma plus sigma minus term is equivalent to, if you go through the math, uh, an Mermer-Sernison gate around uh, the x-axis followed by a Mermer-Sernison gate around the y-axis. So it's just two of these entangling gates that we discussed before the break uh, around um, uh, with, with different faces, one after the other, give me this nearest neighbor interaction, this spin flipping term. So I know how to do each of these terms. Then. Uh, each of these terms is a sigma z, sigma z interaction, which is actually the same as a sigma x, sigma x interaction, only rotated by pi over two. So I can sandwich a, murmur surface, a regular murmur surface and gate uh, around some uh, rotations around the y-axis and get exactly the sigma z, sigma z interaction. And finally, the single qubit z terms are nothing else but 
rotations around the z-axis, which are uh, produced by off-resonant laser pulses uh, that you address on each qubit. So we have seen how you implement each ingredient of this full Hamiltonian, and now, because of the power of digital quantum simulation, <coughs> you can just break the whole thing in steps and apply each of these terms one after the other, repeated times, and look at the time evolution of the full thing. Yes? Yes? Absolutely correct. Yes, absolutely correct. What, I, what we, uh, let's go over this. So what we do is first prepare some spin configuration, and I know that uh, because of my mapping, this is an arbitrary mapping, but because of my mapping, this corresponds to vacuum, 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 vacuum. So I start with the, with a state with no particles or antiparticles present in the system, right? And now turn on my evolution. Uh, if I turn on, ideally, if I turn on my evolution, what, I ha what happens is that particles get created, and annihilated, so, uh, which in, in, my, in my encoding means that spins get flipped, such that if an even spin gets flipped, then it corresponds to a creation of a particle, for instance, and a not spin gets flipped, corresponds to the creation of a of an antiparticle. And, and so at some point, if I now look at the state at each point in time and count, you know, you know which spin corresponds to the presence or absence of particles, so you count how many particles, antiparticles do you have, how many particle pairs do you have. And you plot here the particle number density, uh, which you can instruct just by counting spins up and down. This is very simple. And then you see that uh, you create particles and antiparticle pairs, and at some point the density of particles and antiparticles in your system, which here is pretty small, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, so big that they start annihilating each other. So then they start, uh, the particle density goes down again. So you get these oscillations between the vacuum and the excited states in your system with, with particles and antiparticles. Okay, this is the theory. Now, uh, we're gonna apply the, the Hamiltonian step by step, and this is what we get. So we start in the vacuum and then follow the, the ideal uh, evolution quite well until at some point, because of this, the discretization errors, uh, you start deviating from it. But you can still see uh, the oscillation of the, of the particle antiparticle uh, anti uh, numbers. Uh, trying to understand the performance of the experiment, uh, use, uh, on the red uh, curve we have the, the expected evolution taking into account only discretization errors. This is like we are making a finite step size instead of making the, the steps infinitely small. So how much of the error comes just from, from making this course uh, time steps? It's uh, actually uh, quite a lot. And uh, if we then add to this a model uh, where we take into account experimental errors, so uh, the coherence and um, mostly the coherence, then uh, we get a pretty good grasp, grasp of, of what's going on. You may ask, okay, like why uh, do, don't you make this, the, 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 the time step finer if, if you have this discretization error? Because this means that to cover the same time span, you need to do more time steps, which means a larger number of gates. And in this case, you already have uh, something like two, over 200 uh, gates being applied to the system. Uh, so if, imagine if each gate has a fidelity of, let's say, 99% or 99.5%, and you apply 200 of them, then the fidelity of the total um, operation decays exponentially with the number of gates. Um, so this is why you have to find this, this balance between the, the step size and the, the discretization error. Yes. Yes. Well, it, it, it's more gates per step. You, you can evaluate, uh, let's say it, it's not conceptually hard, you just have to evaluate whether the added number of, of operations per step justifies, so you will get less discretization error, uh, but also less fidelity per step because you're doing more gates. And this is a, a non-trivial experimental question, like given the performance of the gates in your system, how easy it is to, to add the additional overhead to make a higher order to other, to other decomposition. Well, 
Well, uh, in, in this particular one, we, we chose the, the size of the trotter step in such a way that we can see. Uh, this is really like pushing it. Like this is at the, at the very uh, limit of what quantum processors in general can, can do, like a couple hundred gates of, of fidelity of 99.9% .9 per gate, let's say. Um, so in this case, we chose the trotter step in such a way that you can cover an oscillation because less than that uh, doesn't give you much information, and uh, not make it so large that, that, that you kind of overshoot and, and don't even see uh, uh, the oscillation. So, so we aimed at, at something like, like four or five steps per oscillation. Um, okay. Um, now um, you can compare the, the, so one nice thing is that now you can tune the, the, the parameters in your system, which is after all why you're interested in doing simulation, because now, you know, like uh, now that you have everything set up, then the mass of your particles just corresponds to a sigma z term in your Hamiltonian, which is the length of some laser pulse. And you can make this easily longer or shorter so, and, and change the mass of your particle. So you can repeat the time evolution, which is on the horizontal axis, as a function of different particle masses. And what you expect to see is first that the higher the mass, the faster the oscillation, because you are further detuned from your, like from your vacuum state and your excited state. And second, that you have, uh, your, your oscillations have less amplitude. And this is very understandable because the more massive your particles are, the more energy you have to inject into the system, so, so the, the, the fewer particles you can inject, uh, like the, more, the fewer particles get created. And this is exactly what you see uh, here, this is the experimental data, and this is the, what you expect from the, in the ITL case. Um, you can also do stuff, uh, uh, now you can study quantities that, that you cannot even look at in a particle accelerator. Like, uh, say you go to, to CERN, and uh, basically what you can do is count particles, energies, and directions. That's it, it gives you a lot of information, but you, you don't know if your particles were entangled. Here, you do, because you have access to the full wave function. You, if you are smart enough at, at, at seeing, uh, at studying your quantum state, you can learn anything you want about it. Uh, perhaps not all at the same time. Uh, so here we study um, the vacuum persistence, uh, which is basically how much uh, of, your, of your wave function stays in the, in the vacuum, in the initial state. Uh, and entanglement across the, the system. So I, I divide my, my chain in, in, in two halves and then study the entanglement of the left uh, half of my chain with the right half of the chain. Uh, in this case, quantified by the logarithmic negativity. And you see how um, um, the same thing happens. You first start with a product state, which is just the vacuum. Then you create entanglement and as more particles get created across the, the border. At some point, they start annihilating each other, and entanglement actually goes down. And, in, and you create more entanglement, the less massive the particles are, because it, you have to, it's harder to create uh, entanglement when the particles are massive. And it's also harder to create entanglement when the, f when the coupling to the field is very strong, because then to create a particle, you need to pay the energy price of, of creating the, the field that comes with, uh, with, this, with this charge. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say about this experiment. Yes, uh, I had a couple slides left on quantum chemistry simulations, but I think we're closing to the end of the talk. So do you prefer to have like five minutes for questions or? rush through the last topic. Anyone has a question so far? Yes. The ground state of the system, that's an excellent question. It's not the initial state. Um, so in, in this particular experiment, we start with the vacuum, vac so we start with the, with the absence of particles and antiparticles. You know, like we start with, the, which is not the ground state of the system because we, I have interactions. So in the presence of interactions, then uh, my ground state is a, an entangled state, actually, and not the simple product state. Um, your question is how this ground state looks like. It's, I mean, some entangled state. I mean, it, 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 what I would say if, I don't know, do you, like, I, I, I don't have a, a, a good visual, like, 
Do you have any intuition as to how? Yeah, it's So, so the, the the vacuum is not at a trivial, say, like the one which exactly. And, and actually, like like the the experiments that that, uh, that that they're doing at the moment in Innsbruck are precisely okay. How do I prepare the actual ground state of the system and not uh, the, the actual dressed uh, vacuum and not just this this bare vacuum? Uh, and this is non-trivial because. Uh, you know, in generally, given Hamilton, a, a complicated interacting Hamiltonian, finding its ground state is a non-trivial problem. Uh, and one way to do it is, uh, as I was going to explain next, but uh, I'm not going to have the time, for instance, with a... You have five or six minutes if you want. Okay. Um, yeah, but you know, like, I would not like to start something that I'm, like, and rush through it. Uh, if we're out of questions here, then I will quickly explain that. But the, the basic idea then for in your next question might be, okay, if I want to find the ground state, how do I do it? Which I, I cannot just turn on my computer and, and then uh, you can create some, some approximation to your ground state, right? Apply your Hamiltonian and, 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 and measure its energy. Like experimentally measure the, the, all the operators that, that give you the expectation value to your energy and then try to change your state and minimize the energy experimentally. And then at some point, you, your ground state is a state that minimizes this measured energy. Can you do non-abelian gauge theories? Can you? Uh, um, in conceptually, yes. There's no, no um, you will need, so per site, in, in this discretization step of, uh, uh, of the encoding, you will need per site a more complex quantum system. It will not be enough to have just spins up and down because you will need to encode also the, let's say the, the color deg degrees of freedom. Uh, so the different, let's say the different flavors, right? If you, are, so, um, if you wanted to make like an SU2 t theory, for instance. Uh, so you will pay the price of having a more complex quantum system per lattice site. You will need many, deg many degrees of freedom, which you can implement with higher dimension spins, for instance, with more electronic states of your, of your ions. And also, your interactions will be more complex because now your, your spins will interact in a non-trivial way. However, I mean, this does increase the experimental complexity, but in, uh, uh, up to that extent, there is no conceptual problem in, in, in repeating this with a, with a non-abelian uh, edge theory. Concerning the easy model we were speaking also before, if we use a bosonic uh, atomic species or a fermionic one, there are differences uh, in the experimentally controllability or feasibility? Yes. Uh, no. So, <laughs> uh, you're thinking of a... Of a um, so, you're thinking of a, for instance, of a cold atom experiment where my my bosons or fermions are mapped into bosons or fermions in, in, in my lattice, you know? And then, absolutely, the, the, the bosonic or fermionic nature of your atoms depends on, on, on the statistics of your problem, and, uh, and yeah, and you have to use fermions to study fermions and bosons to study bosons. In this case, the, the, the spins are, are given by the internal electronic state of your, of, of your ion, some, some s orbital or d orbital in your, uh, in your valence electron. And the physics doesn't care at all whether your ions are bosons or fermions. They might be bosons or fermions, but, but you're never exchanging them because they, they are very strongly confined and each in, in their side. So there is no interactions between the ions uh, coming from their bosonic or fermionic nature in none of these experiments. All that matters is the electronic degree of freedom and whether it's, you know, in, in one orbital or the other. So you encode that in a two-level degree of freedom, and there's absolutely no interactions apart from that. When you turn off your lasers, there's no, no other physics going, physics going on. And the last curiosity, is it possible to overlap uh, two uh, traps? I mean, using two lasers, using different detuning frequencies, uh, and shifting them, for example, uh, 
linking uh, some valley for, for sides and in the other case for edges. Um, you, you mean to, over, to, to do what? To, 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 to probe their bosonic or vermeulic nature? No, no, could, I mean, this is another question. I mean, just to use two alternative lattices uh, linked by the laser trap. Oh, I mean, uh, no, because the, the lattice is not given by, by the external laser, but rather by the Coulomb repulsion between the ions. So you, you put two ions together, and then they will repel each other because they are both positively charged. And then if you put a third one, then they will also like, repel each other, so you have three ions and, and so on. And there's no lasers involved so far. You don't need any lasers to trap the, the particles. You need them to cool them down, but that's a separate, separate thing. But the lasers get, the, the, the ions get trapped in a crystal just because of their mutual Coulomb repulsion. So no, no, late, no laser lattices. There are, in this experiment, there are no laser lattices at all. So when you uh, introduce the mapping to, uh, to take care of the gauge fields, yes. uh, does that mapping also include uh, the, the sort of like fluxes going through the entire system? Or you mean coming yeah, like from flux loops? Um, like, like coming from, well, in one direction? Taken care of. I, I mean, mm -hmm. so in one dimension I have no loops. Or, 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 you mean, or, or you mean, uh, I, yeah. if I understand you correctly, or, or you mean the, like say I have periodic boundary conditions and then, uh, is that what you mean? Or? Um, no, 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 so, so I was talking about the, the actual flux loops because they, they would be contributions to, for example, a ground state, uh, the actual ground state of the model. Uh, what do you mean by flux loops in, 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 in this context? Uh, so on every link between sides, you yes. would have a gauge field basically going yes. through, and that doesn't violate the Gauss law. Uh, so, um, but right. of course, that's I'm not sure if that's uh, considered in the mapping or so the, the, the degree. So in each link between my my sides, I have a, yeah. a, a gauge field, yes. and in one dimension, the only possible values that this the expectation value of this uh, gauge field can have are integers. So corresponding mm -hmm. to, to so the, the electric values of the electric field are, are, are discretized, and so th these are really all my my, my degrees of freedom right, in in, in mm -hmm. this system. I could explicitly encode them. So this is another uh, in, in quantum link models. I can explicitly encode each of these gauge fields into a higher dimension spin. Say I have whatever spin ten here, and then I have ten possible values for my for my electric field. And, uh, and then I can implement all the interactions and not discard the, the gauge fields. However, in this case, the, the tracing out of the gauge fields is an exact uh, thing. You're just mapping them to these exotic interactions. Um, so I, I have a question about the the ion uh, the ion drop. Yes. Yeah. So you you mentioned that when you're increasing the number of uh, particles that you have in the trap, then the phonon you have a lot more phonon modes which are uh, correct closely spaced. So why don't you um, in, why don't you use uh, less massive particles so that you can uh, increase the spacing? Um, well, the choice of, um, of particles is given by many considerations. One of them is the mass. Um, but, but there's really a lot of things that go into choosing one species. And it turns out there's not so many good species for working with. Uh, to begin with, you want to work with something on the second, I wish I had a periodic table. You want to work with something on the second column of the periodic table because you, you want something that has two valence electrons I mean, it's not an absolute requirement, but it's nice because then when you ionize it singly, then you're left with one valence electron, and, and this has a very simple electronic structure. So then, you know, you can find a, an optical transition that is your qubit, you can find an optical transition that allows you to cool down the ion, uh, and this re requires a lot to, to do this simply on a simple uh, electronic uh, structure. So this restricts you to, to the, whatever, six, seven elements that are on that column of the periodic table and are not radioactive if you don't want to get into complications. 
And, and so these are the, really the, the few popular choices for, for uh, trapped ions. People do, do work with other elements. And then from that, you can definitely work with, with heavier, heavier particles. But usually, you, you, you may pay the price that the wavelengths you have to work with are more less comfortable. So for calcium, you work with red light for the qubit laser and blue light for the um, cooling transition, which is quite nice to work with. In other species, you may have to use ultraviolet uh, light for, uh, for manipulation, and, and that is technically quite challenging. So. And uh, are there ways that you can shield the Coulomb potential in some ways such that you can bring them closer? Uh, you can always increase the Coulomb potential. So you can bring them closer, but this just increases. Um, but, but up to some extent, because um, at, at some point, if you confine your ions too much, then they don't increase. So if your external, the, there's two, two energy scales here, the external confinement and the mutual Coulomb repulsion. And if the external confinement is a lot bigger than the, uh, the inter-ion Coulomb repulsion, then your ions will not form a crystal anymore and will collapse into a, a cloud. And then you cannot singly address them anymore. Um, yeah, I think we're kind of running out of time. I don't know if we have another question. Some extra question, extra time. Bonus question. Not? Thank you. Thank you.